Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two's keynote section. Today, we're glad to have Marietta at online join us. Marietta is a Python core developer and currently a software developer at Zapier. In her free time, she enjoys to contribute to open source. And today's, today's topic would be, oops, I become an open source maintainer. And that's welcome, Marietta. Hello, my name is Marietta, and I'm joining you today virtually from Vancouver, Canada. Um, first of all, thank you so much, PyCon Taiwan organizers, for inviting me. It's quite an honor to be able to join uh, and share my story with all of you today. Most of you probably know that I am a Python core developer. If you're not sure what it really means, what is a Python core developer? Well, I have a talk that is titled exactly that. What is a Python core developer? So please look it up on YouTube. Um, but the short summary is that it means that if you have a pull request to the Python programming language, I can merge it for you if I want to. Basically, I have the commit privilege to see Python. So I'm one of the maintainers of one of the most popular programming language and open source project out there. And for my, contribu co for my contributions to Python, I've received recognitions such as the PSF Community Service Award in 2018. I've also been nominated twice for Google Open Source Peer Bonus, and I've been featured as one of the maintainers for GitHub Sponsors Program. The thing is, I, I am new at this. I've really only started contributing to open source quite recently. My first ever contribution to open source was in 2016. That was only four years ago. Since then, I've continued actively contributing to open source projects. And somehow, I ended up with, be, with being given commit rights to other people's open source projects. And all of a sudden, I felt like I have a set of new responsibilities and I, I wasn't really fully prepared for it. So in this talk, I wanted to share my journey, how I got here. I want to share with you what it's like as a brand new open source maintainer. And I'll, I'll share some of the mistakes that I've made, some of the lessons learned, and why I've continued in this path despite all the mistakes that I've made. And what I hope by sharing my story is that whether you're an aspiring open source contributor or an experienced maintainer, I just hope that you could do it all much better than me. So how did this happen? A lot of people are asking, like, how could they even get started contributing? Um, they want to know whether I have some tips or secrets to share with them. And I'm really glad that people are asking about this. I'm really glad to hear your enthusiasm that you want to contribute to open source projects. The thing is, for me, it really happened quite suddenly. One day, I was just making my first pull request in 2016. By the end of the year, I got commit rights to two projects. And shortly after that, I got the commit to see Python. And I've really kept it up since then. Now I'm a member of various open source projects. But let's, let's backtrack a little bit. Um, the real question you have in mind is this. What motivated me into contributing to open source? Like if I've, al oh, I've always been a user of Python, why did all of a sudden I became inspired to start contributing and to give back to this community? So this really began in 2015 when I attended PyCon in Montreal and I actually received uh, financial aid in order to attend the conference. It was my first ever PyCon and I went to Guido Fedrasem's keynote. In his keynote, he talked about how in the Python core team, there was no women at all. He had just attended the Python language summit at PyCon and it was a room of 50 men, no women. And then he was offering to help mentor women into contributing to Python. So when I heard this, I was shocked. Like it, it didn't make sense. I, it just felt wrong. But back then, I didn't really do anything about this. At that time, I was feeling curious, like how could this even happen? <laughs> 
But back then, I didn't think it's my problem. It was Python's problem, not mine. I just didn't think there was anything I could do about this. A year later, I went back to PyCon, and honestly, I was kind of hoping to hear um, who are these new women Python core developers. But instead, Guido admitted that there were still no women in the team. And he renewed his offer that he was willing to mentor even more women. And that's when it really hit me that there is a problem in the open source community. And it wasn't a technical problem. There is a barrier somehow that in Python for more than 20 years, all the maintainers, all the core developers have all been men. There is a diversity problem. And if I had thought that it wasn't my problem before, this time I realized for myself that this is a problem that I care about. This is my problem now. And I want to help. I want to do something about it. Even though I didn't quite know what I could do, um, I mean, I could just complain. I could just, you know, point fingers and say, hey, Python, you got this problem with diversity and you got to fix this. I could do that. But I just didn't think that was productive. So I thought, I want to give this a try. Um, if I could help in any small way, I want to do my part to help and start contributing to Python and open source. So I wrote an email to Guido and asked for mentorship. And I felt really lucky that he replied. Um, I asked for his advice. I, I told him I've never really contributed to open source before. So here are some of his early advice to me. First, he, sh he suggested that I should focus on modules that I found interesting. And then I should check out the repository and the contributing guide. And if I have trouble following the guide, if the documentation wasn't clear, then I should just start by helping improve the documentation. He also suggested checking out the, the bug tracker and look at issues. Um, but at the time, there were like 4,000 open issues or something. <laughs> and additionally, he suggested I should introduce myself to the mailing list. And he actually meant the Python core mentorship mailing list. By the way, not Python dev. Please do not write an email to Python dev just to introduce yourself. It's not the mailing list. It's not the right mailing list. Um, the thing is, even now, sending an email to any Python mailing list is kind of scary. I, so even now, so I understand if you're reluctant to do this, to write to mailing lists. So, but you get used to it. Anyway, um, back to the story. So initially, I didn't actually find the C Python project particularly too interesting. Um, I followed the advice. I went to the bug tracker, but nothing made sense to me. And I just, I, I didn't feel like there's anything I could do here. Like I didn't feel like I have anything I could contribute or help with. Um, so I started thinking more broadly. Um, if I couldn't contribute to Python, perhaps I'll start contributing to some other projects. So I started thinking about, you know, maybe it will be easier if it's a project where I have some familiarity, where instead of trying to learn a brand new code base, I could just make use of the existing skills that I already have. And that's when I shifted my attention to the python.org project, which is an open source project built with Django. Python.org is where you would go to download Python, by the way. Um, so when I checked out the code base for Python.org, unlike the CPython code base, I felt at home 
in these code days. Uh, it everything seems to make sense because I was already using Django in my work. So instead of feeling intimidated with this code base, I really feel like I can be valuable. I can contribute something to this project. Um, however, at the time, well, Guido doesn't actually know how to further help me with Django. So I was on my own since then. But his general advice still stands. Whether I'm contributing to Python or any other project, one of the first steps is really check out the repository and read the contributing guide. And if it doesn't exist or if there is no contributing guide or it's not complete, not up to date, go, help, go ahead and help improve it. So now that I found a project that I could contribute to, in my mind, all I was thinking about, okay, quick, I'm going to find an issue that I can work on. And I was looking through the issue tracker, but the thing is over time, over, what I needed to do is wait. Um, sometimes the thing or the problem that I could help with, the thing that I could write a bug fix for, hasn't been reported. Um, so what I had to do was just watch the repo. And instead of fixating on trying to create pull requests, I ended up reviewing existing open issues, existing pull requests. I would join the discussions. Um, if it's something I'm not even familiar, I would be asking questions and sometimes also just help verifying whether, you know, yes, this bug still happens or no, this has been fixed. We just forgot to, to close it, something like that. And then the thing is, this, this is how I was given the commit right to the Koala project and to the python.org website. It wasn't because I made hundreds or thousands of pull requests. It is because of my activity there, because the other maintainers noticed my activity. I think they saw that I care about the project just as much as they do. And then they decided that they could trust me and give me the commit privileges. Now, what about the advice of, to introduce yourself to the mailing list? I think it depends. Um, some projects, they would have a something like a Gitter or a Slack or Discord or whatever, where there would be a dedicated channel where new members can introduce themselves. If there is such channel, then I would do it. I would go in and say hi. I also try to introduce myself in person um, when I happen to attend a conference and I notice that the project maintainer is there. I would try try to find the maintainer and introduce myself and just let them know and that I'm a new contributor. And um, as I've gotten more active in the open source, I realized that becoming a contributor to a project is very much like starting as a new developer at a tech company. <laughs> when you start at a new job, the first few days, maybe even weeks, you'd probably be in, in um, onboarding and training se sessions. Perhaps there's a senior engineer assigned to mentor you, to give you a walkthrough of the code base and everything. And after that, Maybe you get assigned a small task and eventually you get more familiarized with the code base. You can start implementing bigger features with, on your own without help. Being a new contributor to open source projects is, is no different than that. It will probably take time for you to understand the code base and the workflow before you can start making substantial feature or bug fix to the project. The biggest difference is generally there is no one assigned to mentor you, to walk you through the code base. I've never got anybody who give me a walkthrough of the CPython code base. It's, it's just something that you somehow have to do this on your own, or you just have to try to ask specific questions about specific part of the code base. 
And instead of spending full time training to get familiarized with the project, you would do open source projects in whatever free time you have available. And it will take time to learn the code base and you need to take the time to learn the code base. It will not happen in a day or two. CPython codebase is almost 30 years old, older than some legacy codebase in, in most startups even. And the thing is, contributing to open source is more than simply let's find an issue and make code changes. It's also about becoming part of the team. You gotta join the discussion forum, participate in the discussions. I think you shouldn't focus only on the open issues and the code base and ignore the rest of the community. So now let me tell you what happened when the first time I became a maintainer. All of a sudden, I found myself receiving lots of emails because all of a sudden I got automatically added to the various repositories within the organization. Even till now, I'm still trying to figure out how to manage my emails. I have lots of Gmail filters now. I feel that my email is somewhat, somewhat more manageable, but still um, every few days, I find myself going to Gmail, look at the numbers of unread emails, and I'm like, mm -mm -mm. enough, Mark has read. <laughs> that, that's my secret. Um, by the way, I'm sorry if I, I miss your email. <laughs> And my GitHub notifications, I've, I've really stopped caring about it, honestly. I've learned in my mind not to, to look at it. <laughs> I've learned to ignore it. And as a maintainer of the project now, I found myself needing to make decisions whether I should merge or reject pull requests. Just because the PR is good, just because all the tests passed, just because I see the merge button there doesn't mean I have to accept the pull request. And especially with a large project like CPython with large user base, often we have to think about the long-term maintenance burden of accepting uh, a pull request and how this PR will impact the rest of Python users. And maybe the contributor created a PR because they just need it for themselves or they think it will be nice, it doesn't always mean that the rest of the community wants the same thing. I have had to reject quite a number of issues and pull requests and just simply telling them that, hey, this is not suitable for CPython, maybe you should just write your own package or something or write your own blog post about this. And sometimes people accepted my decisions. They say, okay, fair enough. Sometimes they just came back and argue for more. <laughs> it's just one of the things I didn't realize I have had to endure. I also didn't realize that in, in addition to owning a project, project maintainers have to deal with code of conduct issues within their projects. They need to do more to do moderating, um, pay attention to the, any comments that got posted to their repository. And if there is inappropriate comments, they have to be on top of it and delete them or something like that. I mean, this is not an easy thing. I've, I've been in code of conduct committee before and I have been the one who had to report incidents. This whole thing, Handling code of conduct cases, moderating is absolutely emotionally draining. I don't think open source maintainers have to deal with this. They have enough responsibilities. And also, like, what happens if the person who are offensive is one of the maintainers? Like, what, what do you do here? I think the code of conduct committee should be a separate body than the maintainers. And for community that is large enough, like Python or even Django, 
You can probably recruit people from within the community and form a specialized code of conduct group for the project. But many open source projects are run by one or two people. Things if it's not the maintainer who handle these things, then who? And on top of all of those responsibilities, one of the roles of a maintainer is kind of representing on behalf of the projects, becoming kind of a spokesperson. I realized that as a maintainer, I'm no longer speaking or acting just for myself, but on behalf of the community. How I choose to act and behave within this community becomes a reflection of the communities that I belong to. And I've made mistakes. I made some mistakes. Um, one of the mistakes I did was early on, I was making big decisions on my own without consulting other maintainers. By big, I meant like I ban a user, kind of big. <laughs> I, bl I, I block somebody from a GitHub repo. Um, the thing is, when you ban or block someone, you're basically rejecting them from your community. You're denying their future involvement. Banning is a serious punishment. Um, I wouldn't say which community this was. It's not Python, one of the smaller communities. Um, what happened is that the person made inappropriate pull request. I just found it disrespectful. I, I didn't want to trouble the rest of the maintainers of having to continue interacting with this person. So I went ahead and blocked the, per the account. The thing is, it's, it's just... Even if the decision was correct in the end, it's just not the kind of the decision that I should have made on my own. I should at least follow some procedure. I should have followed procedure. I should have discussed this and notified the other maintainers that this is happening. Um, at least give a notice to the community that there is an issue here and we need to act on it. Rest assured, I am much better at this now. I know what the process are. Don't worry, I will not ban anyone <laughs> without first discussing or without following the process. But the thing is, um, the biggest mistake I've made is that I wasn't managing my time wisely. Um, I know a lot of people have wondered, how do I balance my life? How do I have work-life volunteer balance? And I, I really don't know. My life is not balanced. I, I didn't have my priorities in the right order. A few years ago, instead of being with my family for Thanksgiving holiday, I was at another conference. Um, there was a time when instead of attending my kids' school performance, I was in another country attending yet a different Python conference. I, I, I wasn't setting boundaries and rules for myself. I was giving too much time and energy to the open source community. In the end, I burned out and went through mental health issues and had to take a month off, a month off from work in order to recharge. But despite all of that, Despite all the troubles I've had to endure, I'm still here and I'm still actively contributing to open source and I've continued saying yes to help maintaining other people's open source projects, most recently to the Gidget Hub library and the PyLadies project. So why do I continue doing this? Believe it or not, if I contributed too actively to a project, to the point of being even commit right, it's really because I care about it a lot. I really do care. Working in open source is unique and it presents very different challenges not normally faced at work. I get exposed to new technologies, new libraries that people are building, and I get to play with those 
way faster than trying to get those introduced at work. For example, in my workplace, we were still using Python 2 until this year. Um, we upgraded now, but we did it also quite recently in early 2020 this year. But when I'm contributing to open source projects, I mean, I've been using F-strings for years. Um, F-strings is a feature that appeared in Python 3.6. So I've really gained a lot from the community. Not only that I'm continuously learning, but I've received awards and recognitions. I received opportunities to travel and meet lots of new people. Um, and it really broadens my, my perspective. And by, when I gain all of that, I have the sense of responsibility to give back. Last year, I attended Peter Wang's keynote at PyCon in Germany, and he was talking about open source community. And he said, in open source, the more you give, the more you get back. And I really find it resonates with me a lot. Another reason why I'm continuing is that almost immediately when I started, I found a sense of acceptance from within the community. Um, when I first emailed Guido and asked for help, I didn't need to prove anything. I didn't need to prove that I'm worthy of this. I didn't have to go to long, day-long on-site interviews in order to become a Python core developer. When I requested financial aid in order to attend PyCon, all I needed to do was just ask. Somehow this community has accepted me, and for once in a long time, I found a sense of belonging, and that is actually important to me. So, that's my story. Now that you've learned about my journey, how I got here, I do have a few more words of advice for all of you aspiring open source contributors and maintainers. First of all, when you were extended an invitation to collaborate and maintain an open source project, ask what is their expectation of you. Um, establish some boundaries, if there is any. For example, when I was first given the right access to python.org, I had no idea what I was supposed to do there. So I, I asked the person who invited me, like, was this a mistake? Um, what? Exactly, did you expect out of me by giving this commit right? Is there, is there, was there anything that I needed to do differently? So, and I, I think it was great that I asked because after that they clarified that I shouldn't, I shouldn't start merging all the pull requests on my own. So at least there is a rule. Um, I should still wait until another maintainer to review, to help review it. So. It, it was good. It gives me a sense of what I could and could not do. I found that many open source projects that I've joined, they have really great contributing guide, which is a documentation aimed to help new contributors into contributing. But they don't have a maintenance guide. There is no new maintainer onboarding guide. And Perhaps the thinking was that if someone contributed long enough to a project, perhaps they know everything already. So there is no need to have maintenance guide. But maintaining a project is not the same as contributing. As if I've described earlier, there are additional responsibilities and powers. So if the project doesn't have the maintenance guide, start one. Um, start documenting as you learn, as you get onboarded. Um, for example, in my experience, what I found is they would give the new maintainer the right access to GitHub repo, but they left out things like, you know, the reader docs, Netlify, or even how you release a package to PyPI. All of this requires additional access rights. Those Things are important and relevant to maintaining a project. They need to be documented. Even if you're not sharing all the access, you should 
at least have a written instruction or a set of information like who could do who could do what. Projects really should have succession plan in place. Um, perhaps there is an unwritten expectation that maintainers will be around for a long time, of course. I've only been in open source for a few years, and in my short time, I've seen various maintainers come and go. Sometimes it's not even about maintainers who are completely retiring, but I'm talking about people who need extended time off. Maybe they're starting a family, starting a new job, a family emergency, or they just, they just need to take half a year off to backpack in Europe or something. <laughs> um, it happens. And it could happen suddenly, and anytime. There shouldn't be an aspect of the project that is owned by only one person. So for example, if you have a package in PyPI, make sure you have a collaborator who can release a package when you're not able to. So I know that open source projects come to conferences and they would host sprints and help new contributors contribute to their project. I think that's really great. Um, we should continue doing that. What I would also recommend is doing an annual sprint just for the maintainers and for the experienced contributors. And whether it's annual or half a year or every two years, I think it probably depends on your project. Um, but for example, Python has an annual core, core developer sprints where we would have one week to focus on implementation and synchronous discussions and collaborations. And the difference here is that we are less focused on mentoring someone new uh, the focus here is really, excuse me, is really to, to ship, <laughs> to deploy, to commit, finish implementing, and help make the next release of Python full of great new features. And I think this is a valuable aspect of this, the, for the project. It helps, it helps with the, the with, it helps make Python, the next Python, better and really important. Another value is in here is that unlike, where, uh, unlike the sprints at conference where you were tired from doing few days on conference and then you have to run the sprint, um, this event is completely separate from the conference. So people really have the energy to focus and and sprint and hack. So even if we, you can all physically meet right now because of the global situations, you can organize an, a virtual sprint, sprint and try to take a few days off from work and hack on your project. That's, that's, that will be useful. Um, now, I know that for a small, there are some open source maintainers who got support by their company. I know that there are companies that give their employees time to work in open source. But most of us, like myself, we do it for free. I don't get paid to contribute to open source. The thing is, getting funding for your project doesn't hurt. Maybe you need money to pay for private GitHub repo or something. Or you need to pay for web hosting for your project. You need a new computer. Or need to travel to host a sprint at a conference. Or you need to take a week off from work so you could do a um, sprint and contribute to your own project. Money makes all of these things happen. But even if you, didn't, you don't need any of that, money is a great reward for your contributions to open source. Your work provides value to other people. Really nice to get paid for it. And there are various options out there um, to help fund your open source project. There is the GitHub Sponsors Program. There is Tidelift, um, Patreon, and Mozilla Open Source 
Mozilla Open Source Grant. So look into one of those and try, do try to get funding. And above all, take care of yourself. Yes, your project is important. Many people depend on it, but it's no more important than your own health and well-being. Remember what your priorities are. Take the time off when you need it and don't feel guilty about it. And if you have written the maintenance guide and if you have the succession plan in place, I'm sure you'll feel at ease leaving your project, your co-maintainers, while you take the time to reach. Thank you so much, PyCon Taiwan, for listening to my talk. I'm again, thank you for organizers for inviting me. If you like to get in touch, you can find me on Twitter as Marietta. And if you find value in my open source contributions, please consider sponsoring me on GitHub. Thank you so much. Thanks for Marietta's wonderful speech. It's filled with is there's a lot of valuable suggestions and experience there. And is there any question on site? Please. Okay. Our staff will hand over the microphone to you. Hello, thanks. Thanks for your hey, hello. Okay. Hi Marietta. <laughs> oh, 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 I should turn this way so you can see me. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks for your sharing. Can you hear me? Hello, yes, hi. Yes, cool, yeah, yeah, hi. Oh, yes, hi. I can see you. Yeah, good, good to see you. Uh, so I remember in 2016, I sent my first patch to C Python. It's about improving uh, PDB module. And uh, yeah, I got some comment from the core developer and I tweak it, but I did not actually realize what he means, so I forget this PR, and until last year, uh, someone mentioned this page, and so I yeah, retweak it and to send the page in a GitHub, and yeah, so, but I found that the original core developer is no longer the core developer, so it's pretty much become an open PR there. And also, I observed that there are a lot of uh, pull requests. Uh, they are in under review status. So actually, there are two questions. That, that is, how do you handle like open PRs this issue, and also how to handle yeah a lot of PR to review this issue. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your patch to C Python, and I'm sorry it takes so long to, for us to respond. <laughs> Um, but the thing is, in C Python, I know it sounds like an excuse, but I've seen that happen. I've seen ticket open for more than four years. Um, so the first question is, how do I, how should we deal with, um, how should we deal with elephant pull request? If it, if you have a, a really, uh, sorry, if you have a pull request that hasn't been reviewed for a long time. It is appropriate to send, um, I've seen people send email to Python dev, just saying, I have this patch, it's been reviewed before, and that you make additional pull requests, but now it seems abandoned because the core developer is no longer there. I think it's appropriate to just ask again in the Python dev mailing list, um, or in the core mentorship mailing list, just if you really care a lot about this patch that you want it to be, if you want it to be landed on the next release of CPython, yeah, do take that proactive, you know, keep asking. Um, in the CPython, we do have tons of, I think we probably have more than a thousand open requests. <laughs> um, it is a problem with us. Uh, we don't have, enough people being able to review it. So if even if you're a co contributor, you're not a core developer, you can help review other people's pull requests. And usually if you do review, and if you choose like, um, if you leave a review, it will, our bot will automatically um, apply the label saying, now this is awaiting core review. 
I know that some core developers are just looking at the awaiting core review labels because that's usually a sign that it's almost done, that somebody else has looked at, into this. So if you could help reviewing other people's pull requests, that will be greatly appreciated. So that's that's my suggestion. Does this help? <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Thanks for your hard work, Inya. I think the, one of the key factors is that how important this PR is. So it will change the way we, uh, how we push, push you to review and accept the PR. But actually, I think some of the uh, author of this pull request, they may not, it's not so urgent for that to, to get on the C, C Python, so maybe, so yeah. And I should no, mm -hmm. okay. I guess I should mention the thing is some sometimes it happens. The we we have several modules that has no owners anymore. Yes, yes, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Nobody's capable of reviewing or willing to take ownership of that. Indeed, that is a problem for C Python. And I think we've been trying to try to recruit more core developers. Um, but it's it's a slow process for us, but thank you for your patience on that. Okay, guys, thanks. Okay, now we're moving on to the next questions. Oh, hello, oh. can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, uh, thank you for your valuable experience, it's very, uh, inspiring and uh, especially I'm also a woman so I'm uh, very surprised that uh, many years ago there's no woman contributor in the Python core and uh, uh, but I want to know more about the mentoring program or how are you mentoring the new contributor and uh, if we want to help more people to contribute the open source how can we do Thank you. Okay, um, so the question is, how does the mentorship works? Specifically for the CPython project, there is a core mentorship mailing list. Um, that's how I started there. I started by introducing myself, as I mentioned in my talk. Generally in CPython, we don't have... Uh, we don't have a signed mentor, as I mentioned. You, it's something that you have to try, take initiatives and ask um, for specific help, specific questions. However, everyone in the mailing list are very open and willing to help. Um, the thing is, sometimes we don't know how to help if you simply come in and say, I'm looking for a mentor. Like we don't know what kind of help you really need. So if you have at least certain goal or a specific, you know, part of this the project that you're interested in, saying I wanna help with this PR, or you can say I'm working on this ticket, not sure how to continue. That's a good question to be asked in the core mentorship mailing list. Now in Open source in general, though, in other open source projects, do attend the sprints if they have it. I know you have sprints last week at PyCon Taiwan. That's a great way to get to know other maintainers of the projects and other contributors. Um, I We have also organized um, the mentor sprint at PyCon where we have like pair up maintainers and new contributors. So if that's something that you're interested in, just keep an eye on such opportunities. Um, other great starting point for contributing that I found valuable was the Hacktoberfest that is happening in October. Um, sponsored by, I think it, it was sponsored by um, Digital Ocean, and it's happening on GitHub as well. I, I started there, um, like I was subscribed to Hacktoberfest newsletter, and it gives 
They share several projects that are newcomer friendly and looking for contributors. So that's that's how I get to know other projects that are available. So that's that would be a, another suggestion. Does that help? <laughs> Okay, the next question is from the Slido. Um, someone asked that sometimes after several contributions to open source, we still fail one of them and don't know what to do. What sh would you recommend for this situation? That is a great question. And that's something I have felt in the beginning. Like I, I, I mentioned I reached out to Guido, but it was, um, very scary. I just like, who am I writing email to Guido Van Rossum? <laughs> but it's just, it's like imposter syndrome. Um, it's something that it's just in my head. Guido didn't think that I'm nobody. <laughs> um, and in my experience, after being in the open source, especially in the Python communities, in the various, not just C Python, but various Python open source projects. People are very welcoming. Um, they, they value your contributions. So I think it's a, my own personal mindset that I need to change, that I should focus on contributing instead of thinking that I don't belong here. Um, my other suggestion is continue participating, um, focus on that. And I know once you've, you've contributed enough, you've made lots of pull requests or you, you help with um, issue triaging or is like commenting on issues. I know that maintainers do notice you. They will notice your activities, that they will know you. Um, so I, I, I guess the, the advice is keep on doing that. <laughs> um, and as I mentioned, what helped me is I do try to get to know the maintainers like when they come to conferences, of course, not now, but when they do come to conferences, I introduce myself to them and it helps me knowing that they know me now. Um, I don't feel less as an outsider after I after at least talking to them in person. That was so. If that is possible in your situation, so um, try it out. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the suggestion. And is there any questions on site? Oh, okay. Hello. Uh, if not, then I have a short question. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, we should take out, uh, take care of ourselves when you contribute to uh, open pro open source project. So I'm curious uh, about: uh, Do you have some concrete suggestion, or what's your st strategy to balance your life, like uh, your daily work, your family, and how you contribute to community and open source projects? Yes, I. So I'm not sure if and, uh, if the things I do will apply to you, but some of the things that I do is really set a time, um, set aside the time. I made a rule that, like on weekends, I try not to respond to any pull requests or something like that. I, in the past, I have also taken like a month long of no volunteering, saying no to things. And in fact, this year alone, I have said no to various volunteer activities um, just because I know I, I couldn't handle that many. Um, that's what I've been trying to do, like really try to manage and allocate time instead of being available all the time. Okay, is there any question left? But, but, oh, 
Okay, so can I follow up the question from the other way around? Because there are many people like aspiring to contributing to open source, but always like sometimes we make excuses for ourselves. We don't have the time. We're already very busy at work, and we're tired at home, and we have other responsibilities. So, how do you find time to contribute to open source? That is indeed difficult.、Um, <laughs> I didn't. I don't have good advice there. What I did is because I was so determined that I want to be more active in open source community. What I did in the beginning is set a goal to myself that、um, initially I said, at least in this one week I must create one pull request, something like that. Just set a goal and make sure I I do it.、Um, By setting a goal like that, it it helps me to. It's it's like it's it's you just have to schedule it, right?、Um, by setting a goal like that, I allocate like one afternoon. I will look at open source issues and try to contribute.、Um, but. Because I consider it at that time, I consider it priority, so I ended up doing doing it a lot. However, I I do understand if people are people are busy with other things already, and honestly, I feel that that is one of the reasons why there is diversity issues in the open source community because contributing to open source is a privilege. You can only do this if you you're satisfied with your work, or you you know all other aspects of your life is probably great already, and then you have free time to contribute to open source. Whereas for women, it is known that in the tech field, women are still getting promoted less, women are still getting paid less than men. So how could we? How could we justify、um, spending free time to open source instead of trying to grow our career?、Um, so it is art. So it is one of the reasons why I see there is this diversity, and I think the the whole community needs to really think about this issue and try to lower the barrier into contributing. But it starts from yourself, like wanting to spend time and so. Yeah. Thank you. There are the questions. Hi, Marietta. Thanks for sharing.、Um, actually, I have a quick question regarding to the gender gap as well, because I, as a woman coder, I can see there is a still huge gap in a room that you can see. Even in PyCon 2020 already, so I'm just wondering, like, what kind of key component you think that is a gap, like to fill up the gaps, or maybe accelerate our our time on filling up the gap? What's the key component? Like, you mentioned the mentor mentor program that is try to open a door for the women to step up, to to just get get through it from the first step, but like you need. But maybe we need other more、um, programs or any other workshops. Like, what do you think that might be the key component, or to initiate women's、um, uh, maybe their inspirations in become a coder or maybe transfer their jobs into data world? Yeah, that's my question.、Um, okay, the question is, how do we? Okay, that's a long question. <laughs>、um, yes, there is there are gaps in in women in tech. I think some of the things that help that I think is the I'm not thinking straight. I think it is going to take everyone's participation. It's not just the women who needs to. Want to volunteer, right? There needs to be opportunities. They need to be given opportunities. We need mentors. We need pay quality.、Um, other things like 
parental benefits to, to, to working moms. I would like to see more companies supporting open source projects by allowing their, employee, their employees to, to contribute. So we don't have to do it in our free time because our free time is valuable for our family. And companies who use Python for free, they need to give back somehow. Um, I, I would like to see more of that happening. I know, I know a lot of companies do not. <laughs> but like I'm doing this still for free, and I, I'd like to see that change. But I think it's it's, it's going to be a slow change. Um, those are my thoughts about this. Does this help? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. This is it's important, and um, it's, it's it's hard. Okay, and we're almost running out of time. And for more questions, you can move to the Discord key track to have more communication with Marietta. And Marietta, thanks for the great talk. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I can tell them. Really appreciate this. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.